morning, everyone. Welcome to Jesus is Lord's ministry here in Gettysburg. Uh, my name is Rick, for those that don't know me, and it's great to be back standing behind this pulpit. I, I enjoy it at 10 o'clock uh, every Wednesday morning. I've got the honor to stand behind this pulpit in Pastor Mike's church and bring the word, and um, such an honor, and I really, really enjoy this, guys, and it's just great to be back. Um, the message today is titled, Wisdom from God, Wisdom from God. So, um, and let's just get started here. Like always, I'm going to open in prayer, and I actually write these down. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives me a nice short uh, prayer to, um, and it's usually associated with the title of the uh, the sermon itself. So um, let's just see where the Holy Spirit leads us, and um, and I hope everybody enjoys the word today. Um, Father, I pray that you remove anything in our thoughts and our minds that would distract us from receiving your word in its fullness and empower us through the Holy Spirit to receive the wisdom of your precious word and keep it in our hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Okay, everybody with a Bible, let's just uh, open to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, and here we go. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God to the church of God, which is at Corinth, and those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus our Lord both theirs and ours. Now, sanctified. Let's go back. Let's look. Let's look into the word. What that actually means. It says in um, ver, chapter one, verse two, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. Sanctify. The meaning is set apart or declare holy. So that that's something to think about as we move forward. Now, God's. You know, Paul's writing this, but he's led by the Holy Spirit. He's saying what the Father's saying. So. Um, it's something to wrap your mind around, that we are set apart and, and declared holy. Um, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what a w good way to start a message. <laughs> Excuse me. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's wrap our mind around this as we go. I mean, it's just starting out just like, words of encouragement and, and blessings over us as right at the very beginning, <clears throat> so, excuse me, verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Grace, so let's just go for the meaning of grace. What actually, what does grace actually mean? And this is just a, a um, a basic uh, um, just, um, definition for it. It is a gift. Now remember that. It's a gift from God given through His Son, Jesus, to give us and enable us with power and spiritual healing. That's, that's the, um, the uh, definition of grace. Now there's different de uh, definitions and if you researched it out, but I like this one. Remembering it's a gift. Grace is a gift, and it's freely given to, to us. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't purchase this. It's, it's, um, un, it's uh, unmerited favor. It's, it's a grace, that, a gift that's actually given to us from the Lord himself. Verse 5, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. Now, I'm going to read that again because this is the stuff as Christians and believers, when we get in this word, we've got to understand what is God is trying to do in our lives that helps us renew our minds and, 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 it, and it helps us take our mind off worldly things. If we really wrap our minds around what he's saying here, I'm going to I'm going to go back to verse 4 and read 5 again. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ himself. Remember the grace, the gift that empowers us, that you were enriched in everything by him, by Jesus, in all utterance and all knowledge. And that's huge. If we really understand what Jesus has done and what God has done through his son, we're on the way to a victorious life and healthy life and um, prosperous life. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, a testimony of Christ confirmed in you, 
for me, for, for just a, a quick testimony for myself, 14 years ago, I was in the party scene, drinking and getting high and all this kind of stuff. And a, that one of the biggest testimonies or one of the biggest miracles I've had was God delivered me from alcoholism and, and, and carrying on a lifestyle like that. Even if it was just weekends, you can convince yourself that, well, and I've even had friends say, you, you don't have a drinking problem, Rick. You just, you, you know, you just party. You just drink a couple of beers on weekends. But no, if, it doesn't matter if it's a day, an hour, uh, no matter how, if you're in bondage to something, you, it, 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 it's got a hold of you. You know, you're, you're, <laughs> you got to cast this stuff down. And if you give your life to Christ, you're going to start seeing these things manifest itself because that's the power. That's part of the grace, the enabling power and the spiritual healing, which will lead you away to, from this, um, path of destruction, this wide and broad path of destruction, and get you on that narrow path to living a, a righteous life. Verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, there it is the word gift again, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that again because this is also important and we'll look into Revelation. Verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, this is God. This is Jesus. He, don't, he, he wants us to get everything in its fullness. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of the Lord, um, the definition of revelation, is a divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence in the world. That's the definition of revelation. It's the bringing to our knowledge and our thoughts, even in our natural minds, the, the existence of humans, why we're here, where did we come from? This theology of, um, you know, of us coming from apes and all this kind of stuff is so ridiculous. It's, it's almost comical, you know, um, like if, uh, simply, Humans, if just the average person would pick up this book, especially at a young age, and start reading this, this would be your education, this would be your doctrine, this would be your, your history, and what a difference it would make in the world. But um, we're, we're going to pick up today, 2023, where, you know, we can we can have our minds renewed from this word, and, and it, no matter what age you are, and get Get the education from the Lord and in in this Holy Bible to get you where you, you need to be. Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. We want to be blameless in the eyes of the Lord. We're not going to be perfect. It, it, he's doing a work in us and it says in the Bible he's going to finish it up to the day of his return. So it's it's constantly daily staying in the word, learning, educating yourself, actually, um, um, spiritually more than anything. It's OK to sit down and study and pick up your Bible and really look into it and want to understand the history of, of, of this holy Bible. And but spiritually you're going to start changing and, and renewing your mind and you're no longer going to be the same person that you were before you picked up this Bible. Um, you're going to, it's called, you're, you're going to become a peculiar person because you're not going to think like the world. You're, you're not going to, your, your mind is going to be renewed in the ways and the, and the, and the righteousness of the Lord. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We're called. We have to receive that calling, though. I, I think I spoke on the, the, what the elect meant last time I stood here. And um, I thought, you know, uh, we were elected by God. It felt like you were called by God. But guess what? You've got to receive that calling. You've got to elect yourself to elect. To, to choose God in, in, um, in his ways, not because the world is going to try to talk you out of it. The ways of the world are going to try to lead you to that broad path to destruction. Verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. To me, that's starting to talk more about the churches. Um, we have to be careful where division won't find its way into the church body. For example, like some people are going to say, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Catholic, and so on, that their doctrine may be different than what you've been taught, say, versus a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church. This is not, a, this is what we have to be careful of. Even the church body itself today, uh, verse 11, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Cleo's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, Paul's addressing a group in Corinth that's that this there's there's division in the church body. Then he came to Corinthians or to Corinth to to address that. Verse twelve. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am, I am of Paul, I am, a, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? This is how, even in the church body, you can be taught some doctrine. That's why it's so important to get into the Bible yourself. You pick up this Bible and the Holy Spirit will help tutor you and help you to get to where you need to be. You're, that way you're not totally depending on putting all that. Really, you're putting that on your pastor or the leadership of the church when you're sitting in that congregation hearing that word. If you, because some of these teachings apparently weren't right. These people were serving Paul and um, Apollos and these guys like they were Christ. And that's, a, a, you're, you're, you're not on the path of that narrow path to righteousness because that's worldly thinking. Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. Least any would sh anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. S verse 16, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, of, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And that should be the focus of every pastor behind this pulpit, including me Why I'm standing here, um, that we were sent to preach the gospel, whether you just like I, I look at myself as a messenger or, or, you know, or a vessel that God is using to speak through to. But but for what? But to spread the gospel. That's where our focus should be. Um, and let the Lord and the Holy Spirit get in the word and you know, the people that are standing behind this pulpit and speaking and let the Holy Spirit lead us and and. Um, that way we won't get off track and, and, and try to, we may come off like we're looking at, you may look at some of the speakers as knowing more than you and wow, they're standing out there behind this pulpit preaching and speaking, but that's only, we should, us guys doing this, we should all seriously be surrendered to the Holy Spirit um, and just preach the gospel. Uh, uh, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And I'm not the greatest speaker. And that's awesome because God still called me out. And I've been in ministry for 12 years. Uh, most of it with, was in youth ministry and even teaching Sunday school with my wife. Um, but I, at one point when I first got into uh, the, the uh, church and, and the, the leadership approached my, myself and my wife and asked us if we'd be willing to teach a Sunday school class. We, I felt so um, unprepared, unqualified. Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't do well in school and even up to my senior year. It's just, but that would be it would make sense if you were as you as we read on you'll see why the, uh, God chooses the least of the least verse 18 for the message of the cross I really like this 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 passage for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us us believers us guys that are sold out on the Lord 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's that power. That's that Holy Spirit, man. That, that's what drives me uh, to come out here on a Wednesday morning joyfully to stand here and speak. It's that power. Uh, and, I, it's, it, and it comes to me because I, I, I believe in the Word I don't, and, and God's Word. It's not foolishness to me, but to the world, it's foolishness, you know. Um, let's go and see where this leads. To me, this, is, this word is getting exciting for us believers. It, re it really is. For it is, verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, this is God's word, and, to, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudence, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? These people that want to judge uh, the, whole, the Bible itself and say, we don't want that in our schools. We don't want a, a prayer time in the morning to open up our classes like it used to be in elementary school. Um, where are these people today? That, that brought this into our society, into our schools. Where are they today? You know, a lot of these people that stood and, and got in a position where they could even have laws changed or um, this kind of stuff to, to take something so good away from our children. Where are they today? You've got to ask yourself that. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, through the worldly wisdom, you, you, will, you will not know God, is what it's saying. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The foolishness of the message. Just, just say, for example, the, you, the whole world knows their sin, whether they want to call it sin or not. That there, there's, if, the, if you didn't see it, then you, you're missing the people that break the laws even to like even to murder and adultery and um, stealing and all these things that that so you can't deny the sin of the world but um, so it pleased God through the and so the so when you say well this man we call Jesus God sent his son to take away that sin to take away that that um what caused us to sin when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? It, it separated us from God. So we were, we were in sin. So, but it's foolishness to the world to, that to think God, God the Creator, would send His Son to die for that sin, which the penalty for sin is death. Well, that's part, it's foolishness to the world. Now, see, that's what it's kind of talking about there. Verse 22, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews and the stumbling block to the Greeks' foolishness. But to those who are called, back to us again, the called, the people that received that calling and elected to believe in Christ, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let me read that again, verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's what we're receiving, the power and the wisdom of God through belief in His Son, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, it's saying... Whether the world wants to believe it, or believe it or not, I don't know the percentage of believers and non-believers, but I know that from what I understand, the Bible wouldn't say the, the, the path is broad and wide to destruction and the path to, is narrow to, the, to holiness and righteousness if there was a, so obviously a smaller percentage of people that believe. So, but it's, it's um, God saying though, that it's, it sounds like foolishness, but we believe in this Jesus he sent to take our sins away, but the world won't receive it. They don't believe it. So, but that God's calling, you know, it's still greater that we believe in, in this and in, in what the, the Bible says about him sending his son. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. See, there it is in, in, in right in the Word of God. Verse 27, 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Now catch this. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame to the things which are mighty. There's a lot going on here, guys. If we catch this, like you might look at yourself as not, like I did back years ago. I didn't feel qualified to teach a Sunday school class. I didn't feel prepared. I didn't feel educated enough. I didn't feel like I, I could be a teacher in front of a, a group of children to teach them. Actually, a teacher. That's why they call us Sunday school teachers. But no, that God chooses that way you'll know that it's God and the Holy Spirit. You don't, it's not you. If, you. if it was you, you, you wouldn't be able to stand, like even me today, standing here speaking God's word. I got to rely on the Holy Spirit. I'm not a seasoned pastor. I haven't gone to a school to learn how to preach and teach the word. I, I have to solely depend on the Lord. And it's the same thing. It's like, and I am like, um, with an education or a doctrine degree and 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 um, the theology of the of the word, I have n I have none of that. So I am definitely, I stay in the word on my own and and and, and read my Bible daily. But I still I am not trained up in on public speaking and preaching. See, let's go to verse twenty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen. So somebody might look at a guy like me. I just some biker guy, you know, and uh, you know he he seems like he's a Jesus freak, but it's all excited now. But it'll wear off eventually, and he'll go back to his old ways. But <laughs> that's not how it works. If you truly receive Christ in you, and you receive the Holy Spirit, you are not going to be of your own anymore. You died to that self, and you're now living for Christ, and you are going to change. Trust me, there were people that would have known me 15 years ago would never in a million years think Rick would be standing behind a pulpit preaching um, like this. Is that's, I'm just using myself for an example. Trust me, not to lift myself up in any way. I'm trying to give you an idea. The person I was, but after receiving Christ and dying to that old man in old ways, was born again a new creature in Christ Jesus, and that's the before and after. And I'm using myself for example because, you know, we it's part of my testimony. And the things which are, okay, let me, let me start at 28. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that are verse 29, that no flesh should glory in its presence. You have to be careful how I speak because I don't want the people listening to think there's any pridefulness in describing the before and after. No, I'm going to give all the glory to God. I, I am not educated in this, in this kind of stuff. That's what I'm trying to explain. But I can still God put me here to, and I have a job to do or a calling and, uh, to, and he chose me to do this for a reason to reach to reach people that are like me before the, the uh, surrendering to Christ and believing in, in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and the righteousness and sanctification of and redemption the, and the meaning of redemption it is the work of christ on our behalf to purchase us with the price of his own life that was the penalty we were born into sin whether we like it or not you don't, you if you don't want to call yourself a sinner that's fine but you, it is what it is it, that's what the bible calls it and this word is truth you're not going to find it, any book on this planet that's fully true other than the bible itself so we are sinners and we were born into sin at the fall of man in the in the garden when adam and eve sinned so with sin you are not going to enter into heaven but there is a there is a there is a solution there's an answer we have we'll actually know the end of the story once you receive christ as your lord and savior and and remember and you you need redemption you need those sins forgiven and that's what this this and through this entire book is about it's leading us into a path 
briefly to the narrow path of holiness and righteousness through this through this word. It's very, very important. We got a little more time. I'll get into chapter two. Corinthians chapter two, verse one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. And boy, that fits fits me to a T. I don't speak, I don't have eloquent speak, speech, speech, there you go. And, um, but God's still going to use guys like me and people like me because we're not coming to, imp- I'm not here to impress you with my speech and, and, and the perfect message and the perfect sermon. No, I, I can only, I'm coming here to the best of, that I can, Rick Woodward can do with the experience I have and totally sold out in the Holy Spirit to bring the word. That way God's glorified, Jesus is glorified. I'm just standing here as a messenger. Verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what I want. I I just want to be here just speaking this message through the Holy Spirit, Jesus in me, and Him crucified. That's that's my goal here today. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And this is Paul speaking. And he was a Pharisee of all Pharisees before he accepted Christ. And my speech and my preaching were not with pers- persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit of power. And I'm hoping that's what I'm doing today. I... um. I'm not with bringing persuasive words and human wisdom. I'm breeding the word of God and trying the best I know to explain what this word means so we'll all understand it, so we can all come to the saving grace and saving knowledge of Christ. Verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. Your faith should not be in the wisdom of me. Even Pastor Mike and Season, Pastor Gary and Pastor Pete, these guys that are so full of the Holy Spirit and sold out on the Lord. I mean, you, you don't want to depend on their, their, their sermons and their speech and, and other seasoned pastors that stand behind this pulpit. But... Um, you want, they're still men, they, they, we're all men here. You want to put your faith in the power of God. It's what it's saying. Verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not, not the wisdom of the age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. There's going to be people that seem people of influence. You might watch on, say, if you watch the news, which I don't, but... Uh, there's people that maybe even a celebrity or somebody on social media you look up to and you 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 look to them for guidance and wisdom. But guess what? They're coming to nothing. We're all going to leave here one day. We're all going to perish. I mean, that's the thing of be, being on this planet and being born. There's a beginning, but there's going to be an end. So unless you knew Christ, there's not good. There may be a lit end to your physical presence here on this earth and in, in, in a physical body. But the cool thing is there is not going to be an end if you accept Christ and enter into heaven because that's eternal. And so, so important. And I'll, I'll close with that. But I want to go like I usually do. Touch on how do we get that eternal life I just spoke about? What, how does that work? You know, and I'm going to do the best I can to um, talk about salvation here. Um, salvation itself. Okay. Um, salvation is simply, is simply put, this is just a narrow down, as simple as I can put it um, for us to all understand. It is the salvation is the act of being forgiven of your sins, the sins I keep talking about, the, the fall of men, the sin that was in the garden that we actually inherited through Adam and Eve's, um, you know, making that mistake and sinning against God. But the salvation, we need forgiveness for that sins, and the salvation is being forgiven, forgiven of that sin and being granted eternal life with the Lord in hell awesome how beautiful is that that's salvation itself but we have we have to be careful of um 
how are we going to how are we going to approach God with the sincerity of our hearts to receive that salvation? Because too many of us, I think, have been in church, and I've done it a few times myself. You'll sit in a, a congregation in a pastoral, either you can stand up and come to the altar, or you know. Uh, he'll say, repeat after me and give you the prayer of salvation, which I'll do um, just to get it to see. And I'll try to explain how all this get, works. But um, even in your quiet time, not, e not even in a church setting, when you pray that prayer of salvation we're talking about here, the, the prayer itself is, is not going to get you into heaven. And that that just just listen to how I've, I've, I found this on the internet. I really like it. It's the repentance and the faith behind the prayer that lays hold of salvation. It's not actually the prayer of salvation itself because you could speak it and go through the motions and not really understand or have a sincerity of your heart, but you've spoken the prayer of salvation. Well, if less there's a change in you and you receive the Holy Spirit, I would really... Um, question my the sincerity of the prayer and I, I hope I was clear on that the prayer of salvation goes like this Lord I know I have sinned now you be serious you've you've come to the end of your rope you know you need a savior you understand you are a sinner so that's what when you're talking to the Lord himself our creator Lord I know I have sinned I believe I believe, and you mean it, you're believing in your heart that, that Jesus or that God the Father sent Jesus to die for your sins. The penalty for sin is death. Now, your sins are, are paid for if you believe that. Verse 3, Lord, I receive your forgiveness for my sins. You're for receiving it. You believe. Your sins are wiped out. You believe it. And believe you raised Jesus from the dead. Now you're making that promise. For this day forward, I promise to live my life for you. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I pray. And thanks a lot, guys, for your time. I'll see you next Wednesday.